In this video, I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know in order to make your application even more performant. All of that knowledge is based upon core web vitals. And what I'm going to do is take all of that knowledge and make it more concise and understandable for you. So you can follow these simple steps and achieve higher performance. If you're ready, make sure you subscribe to this channel, smash like under the video at the end of the video, if you like the content. And with that said, let's get started. All right, friends, so we're going to go over all of these items that I've compiled here in order to optimize for each part separately, each part of the core web vitals. So first, we're going to start with the LCP, which stands for the largest contentful paint. And what it means is basically the largest thing that you see after loading the page. In our case, in this SPA, it's basically this, this banner. Okay, this is the biggest thing that we see after loading the page. In other websites, it can be a video, maybe it can be another banner, it can be just a text, you know, it can be different things. But in most cases, it's actually the image. And how do we actually optimize for it? So first of all, we're going to understand that there are different subparts of LCP. So for example, in this example, we have our waterfall diagram. And our LCP resource, this green one is actually an image, okay, as in most cases. So we're going to try to divide this LCP loading into different chunks that we can optimize. First, we're going to start with the time to first byte, basically, while the HTML is being requested, the document itself, then we are trying to load the resource, but there's a delay before the resource is being downloaded, because the tree a handshake has to happen, a request has to be made to load the resource. And then there's an actual load of the resource. This is when the image has start starts loading. And then the fourth part is basically the rendering of it, because it can also be delayed because of scripts. Now, in order to optimize each part, we need to understand which part is actually more important. So we're going to see that according to statistics, what contributes to the LCP score the most is actually the very first part. So time to first byte and the resource load duration. So which means time to first byte this very first part while the document itself is loading takes the most time and also loading the image itself. Resource delay and rendering delay are contributing only 10%. Now we have to focus on them. So what do we do? We're going to start with the resource load duration. So how can we optimize that? First of all, we're going to try to use responsive images. What does it mean? So whenever you try to load an image, you can define a size for it. Okay, let's say your image is, is a large image for a banner. But what if you're trying to use a mobile app? Okay, a mobile version of your website? Well, in this case, you can actually define different sizes of this image, maybe a smaller size, and maybe a bigger size as a default. Here's the default. Okay, so with source set attribute, you can actually define different images, in this case, one JPEG, and this is a description of it, and then another JPEG, another description of it. And in sizes, we basically put our conditions saying when it's max with 600 pixels, then take the version that is 480 pixels, you can also use a VW here. So for view viewport width and so on. This is a bit complicated but I'm going to leave all these links in the description, guys, so you can read it yourself. But basically, we also have another way of using this by using this picture element, where you can separately put all the sources that you need. I find this more descriptive. So I would rather use this one. So we can have a second source, which is basically according to this condition and loads another source, and we can have a default image with an alt tag. Okay, by this, you can actually separate say which resource you want to load based on your screen width. And this is going to make your image loading. So here much faster, if for example, you're using a mobile device. Another point is that you can also try using server side rendering because server side rendering also improves performance by offloading some of the rendering text to the server. Meaning when we do server side rendering, this part resource load duration, element rendering delay, and partly resource load delay is going to be done on the server, which is much faster than to being done in our browser. Okay, the next one will be the preloading. Okay, what is preloading? Well, you know that in HTML, you can define the links like this, for example, a style sheet, 
but you can also attach a preload attribute to it. So preload is gonna do the following. Let's say this is our website, right? And we're trying to fetch different photos of different cities based on this photos JSON. So preload is basically gonna take this london.jpg if we attach a preload london.jpg in our HTML header, it's going to put it right here. So it's gonna preload it right after the HTML has been loaded and this tag has been discovered. How cool is that? By preloading this, we can know that our LCP, given that it's the london.jpg, is already shown as soon as the page has been rendered. Okay, that's why I try using Using preload, you can preload a lot of things. So you can preload fonts, you can pr attach it to a fetch request, image, script style, and track. Okay, the next one is the fetch priority property. It's similar to preload, but what it's gonna do is that, let's say our London JPEG is here, it's gonna bring the London JPEG even above the font loading. So it's gonna stand here. So not only it brings it forward, but it also puts it above the other request. That's why fetch priority is so important. And you can actually define different types of priorities. You can have high, low, and auto. Okay, if you do, if you put high priority to an LCP image, it's, it's actually gonna increase your LCP score. Okay, speaking of the LCP score, let's actually try to see it ourselves. So we're gonna go to the performance tab in the in the dev tools. And if we try to refresh our page, we're gonna see that, okay, loading finished, we can stop this, we're gonna see that our LCP score is quite bad. So it's 3.25. This is not the best, but we know that our banner is loading quite slowly, okay? Our CLS is also quite low. We're gonna talk about this in a second. Okay, so going back to our list, we can also make sure that we don't have any lazy loading. Okay, so the image tag has this loading lazy. This is a relatively new browser feature, meaning if your image is somewhere below the viewport and it's a long page, you can actually attach loading lazy to this image and it's the browser is not gonna load it right away, but rather when it discovers it. And if you attach this to an LCP element, this is gonna load your banner very, very slowly. Okay, the next point is back forward cache. What is this? Maybe you have heard of it, but mostly not. So back forward cache is basically this thing where you would use the browser controls to go back and forward. And funny enough, this contributes to almost 20% of the web interactions when we use our web pages, meaning we often go back and forward. And when you when a user goes back in your web page, what you want to do is make it faster for them for them to basically navigate back and forth. Okay, that's why browsers can do this automatically. But there are some cases when this cache doesn't work. Okay, and this cache doesn't work when you try to have unload events. For example, this unload event, when you try to do something when the user unloads the page, can actually remove this um, automatic back forward cache. So try not, not to use the unload event intentionally. Also, the different APIs and extensions, actually we can debug this back forward cache in this application section. So we have this back forward cache and we can test it. And we're gonna see that this single page application that I have here is actually having some problems with the back forward, web back forward cache. For example, web authentication API is not eligible for back forward cache. So just test your application for the back forward cache. Another thing is the pre-rendering of pages. So Google Chrome and many other browsers are actually smart, meaning when you try to type tip someone or type someone something in the URL, it's actually gonna do some calculations behind it. So if you just put S, it's gonna probably think that they are going gonna go to the to this URL and have its own confidence. So it's gonna predict it and it's gonna load this uh, resource, okay? But you can also help it nowadays. So this speculation rules API is relatively new in the browsers. And on your page, you can manually define which pages it should try to consider. So for example, these following URLs, you can also have some conditions with href matches and selector matches. So it's gonna try to preload them. For example, when a user hover overs this link, like I'm doing now, document rules, it's gonna already reload the resources in the background. So the browser does half of it automatically nowadays, but you can also help it by using this speculation rules, okay? And last but not least, going here, we can try to optimize this time to first byte. Like 
like here. Okay, so this time to first byte, let's say is still a big deal. Okay, we don't have that much influence of it programmatically, except for doing the following using a normal CDN. You don't have to use AWS, you can use another CDN, but CDN basically stands for the content delivery network and it's um, spread across the world. So most likely your region has its own CDN and the websites are gonna be loaded faster there if you deploy your application on a CDN, okay? On the edge, so to say. All right, now we talked about LCP, let's also talk about the CLS. So let's optimize for the cumulative layout shift. What is this? So as we saw just before, our cumulative layout shift is quite bad. Okay, it's 0.21 and it has to be lower than that. Why does it happen? Well, because our banner is pushing everything down after it's being loaded. So if we try to record this so that it records it and now it's being pushed down and let's stop the recording and analyze that. So we're gonna see that we have layout shifts section here and if we hover over this, it's gonna show us how exactly the layout shift happened. So we can see that our navigation items are moving to the left some for some reason. And we also have another big layout shift, namely this banner that pushes all the elements down. Okay, this is how we can debug our layout shifts. The browser already knows all of that. Now, how do we remove that? Okay, so first thing first, you can set explicit sizes on elements. Okay, so you can either set an explicitly a width or height, minimum height, for example, for the image itself to this banner, or for example, if you want a nice background instead, you can also set a maximum size and have like a background to the div element behind this image. Or you can simply use an aspect ratio if you already know the dimensions of your uh, image, okay, of your largest contentful page, so to say. All right, just make sure that you set default sizes. Okay, so that when the image loads, it already has a size and it doesn't push anything to the bottom. That's the that's the trick. Okay, next point will be also considering byte forward cache, because if you go back to this page, we know that we already loaded everything. So there will be no shift in elements, there will be no pushing down or left or to the right everything loads instantly. Also try to not have these weird animations that induce or that are layout inducing animations. Because as we saw in this example, we go to the left, we see that our, um, as you can see in this recording below that's, that's playing, we can see that our navigation elements kind of fade in and move to the left. So it also contributes to the bad LCP score, or well, not LCP, but CLS score, okay? So try to avoid these animations that cause layout shifts, okay? The next point would also be uh, using the browser's composition thread. What does it mean? So we can animate different things by, for example, animating our margin or animating our padding or uh, position relative and using the top, top left, right to push elements around. But this is considered a bad practice, okay? So bad practice because every time you do this, the browser has to, first of all, run the JavaScript or CSS, if there's no JavaScript, then do layout calculation, then repaint everything and then do the composite calculation, okay? Now, if we instead try to use only these properties that don't cause all the whole round trip, we're only gonna do the style calculation and the composite calculation. It's gonna be much, much efficient, okay? Which means always try to use the transform property and opacity. These are your best friends, okay? Don't use margin padding and anim don't animate those. Instead, use this because the browser is gonna try to offload these tasks into onto a GPU and it's gonna be handled in a different thread, so to say, not on the main thread, not cause any junk on your website, okay? Then we talked about CLS, and since we're talking a lot about debugging here and performance, performance is important in our applications as well as making sure that there are no bugs in our application. Which is why I want to mention our today's sponsor, Squish, which is an excellent tool for functional GUI test automation. What is cool about Squish, you may ask? Well, Squish provides an efficient and agile automated GUI testing with multi-toolkit applications. 
It has a ton of powerful features that can tackle any testing challenges you might have. But some that I found the most beneficial are, for example, recording and playback. You can record, edit and execute tests with Squish without a steep learning curve. It's very intuitive. The tool also offers extensive integration options. It's fully compatible with CI CD systems and version control, streamlining your workflow for rapid deployment. Another example for its versatility is that it's available in whichever scripting language you use. And it's especially good at testing applications on multiple different platforms. Whether you're working with Java, Windows or anything else, Squish has you covered with powerful property-based support. There are a lot of materials on Squish online, but I'd actually recommend trying out this interactive tour so you can see firsthand how it exactly works. You really get a good general idea and feel of the tool. If you want to support my channel, then make sure to check out today's sponsor. You will find the link to the tour in the video description below. So go try it out and let me know what you think. And now back to the video. All right, so now we talked about two of the main core web vitals. We're gonna also talk about interaction to next paint, also known as INP. This has been introduced recently in 2024 instead of another older one, which people didn't really like, but this one is stricter and it basically talks about um, the interactions on your page. So let's say I click on one of these buttons. The trick is how responsive the page becomes after interacting with the page. So for example, let's say if there's a lot of things happening on the main thread, I click on this button and it's gonna take a long time until the next frame appears on the page, okay? But this is not really noticeable in our page because it's actually a fast one. So this is what this INP interaction to next paint is all about. And how can you actually help make our application faster when user interacts with it? Well, first try to break up long tasks, okay? So let's take a look at it. So trying to break up long tasks is basically this. So let's say a user interacts with the application and then we have a very, very long task and then the event handler runs. So while this task is running, the user is basically gonna have a lag on this page. That's what we don't want. Instead, what we want to try to, or we want to be able to break up this long task into many smaller ones so that the event can be handled right after the input has been received, okay? And how exactly do we do that? So imagine we have this function, save settings, and we're trying to do a lot of things while we're saving the settings. Let's say we have other five methods that are being called or functions that are being called inside it. So one thing could be this, doing everything in a row, and then you'll notice that we have some junk here, which is red. So the task is very, is, is a long time, long taking task. This is what we want to avoid. Instead, what we can do, and maybe you didn't know that or did, this is kind of looking hacky, but it's one of the ways to do, to achieve that. So you can do the critical work here, basically validate form and update the UI. And also works that's not visible to the user. So this basically, you can offload it to, you can yield it to the main thread, okay? You can set timeout and zero. Yeah, I know that it is kind of counterintuitive. What are we doing this? But by putting things into a timeout, it kind of makes this work async. So it doesn't block the main thread anymore. It kind of spawns another thread, so to say, even though it doesn't, but it doesn't stop the main thread. So you can either use that, or you can also use this API that has been relatively new. So task scheduling API, and it basically looks like this. It's the scheduler, task scheduling API, and it has two methods, post task and yield. So basically you can do the following. You can uh, do first half of the work that's important, then you can yield and um, for example, post task also receives a callback. You can put things into the post task and it's basically the same thing as putting a set timeout here, okay? This is how you can break up longer tasks. Another thing is also making sure that your application doesn't have any unused code and your bundle is, is as small as possible. So in this sources tab, every time you navigate to your JavaScript files, you can see the coverage. So you can see how much of JavaScript is actually, or how much of the code that you have is actually used by the application. And if you see that your application actually is using only 50% of the code that you have, then you're probably not uh, compressing your application or you're not doing one of the following things. First of all, tree shaking. 
what is tree shaking? So let's say we have two functions that are that we're exporting, but the sum function here um, doesn't end up being used in the final bundle. So tree shaking is going to notice that uh, that it's going to notice that it's not, never being imported anywhere, and it's going to remove it from the final bundle. This is what we want, and a lot of bundlers such as Webpack are are able to do that. So make sure that it's always on. Also programmatic rendering or laser loading can also help. For example, in Angular, we're easily able to load, uh, for example, components like this. So within the code, we can import parts of the application like this or have lazily loaded modules, meaning pages or parts of the application are being lazily loaded based on a condition. Okay, try to do that. Also, again, um, try to avoid layout thrashing. What is layout thrashing? Is It is when we do a lot of computations, for example, we have a for loop and we're trying to modify the width. Okay, we're trying to interfere with the styling and modify with the width. This is bad practice. Again, use compositor only anim uh, or animations like we discussed before. Okay, don't do that. This is going to this is going to make your website slower. And also a new thing that has also been introduced, or not really new, but since 2020, but not really used by many, is the content visibility property. What does it mean? So, for example, is, let's say you have a long website, and you know that some of your parts of the application are below the viewport. So while you're scrolling the page, let's say I'm on this page, um, why would I render many things that are below my viewport? Okay, and you can help the browser and say that. Here's the property that we need. Content visibility auto. So it's not going to load those um, heavy things. And you can actually define an intrinsic, intrinsic size. And there are many gotchas here and edge cases. So I'm going to leave all of these links, as I said, once again, in the description. So you can go over this yourself and understand the implications. Okay, but this is how you can make your website even faster, even more performant and make sure your INP interaction to next paint is as fast as possible. If you like this video, guys, I know that we didn't have any demos because of the time limitations. This would have taken too way too long. Otherwise, I hope you still liked it. And if you did smash like, I will see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.